Well, good morning and welcome everyone. I appreciate you guys coming out for this. Um, my name is Justin Maroney. I'm a solutions architect here based locally out of you know, Phoenix uh, area, um, you know, working on a local team and, you know, happy to, to help, you know, go through this with you guys. So the idea today was kind of talk about some modern segmentation strategies and kind of how segmentation has evolved over time in, in uh, uh, network environments, kind of why we need it and, and what the future of this kind of world looks like. So with that, I can get oh, my clicker just died. All right. So let's kind of start off, I guess, level setting, right? Why do we need net network segmentation? Uh, I think everyone's first reaction, right? We start to think about security reasons, but there's generally, you know, even more ideas before that. So if we even go back, you know, forever ago before we got really crazy in this this bad actor world, right? There were still reasons to do it. You know, number one's on improving performance. So we start to think about like, maybe you want to rate limit out uh, guest network, do some level of QoSing, uh, things like that, right? We want to break it and segment it so we're putting the right type of application and the right type of network so we can put the right policy to it. Um, limit cyber damage, right? And we can, tons to go into on there. Um, protect vulnerable devices. You know, the, this is generally often speaking, thinking things like uh, Windows 2012 servers, Right, I've had tons of clients and customers, especially like think of like an NVR, right? I have an old NVR stuck in an old closet. It's probably running Windows 2012. Right, how do we protect that in an application that probably should be upgraded, but someone else controls it? They can't, you guys, you know, <laughs> IT sometimes can't get out to, to touch that stuff. And another big one is re reduce audit and compliance reasons. So like I've worked in environments that were heavily PCI regulated and trying to get what gets audited into a small bubble, so that's all that's getting looked at as opposed to big environments is really important and critical too. Um, if we look at kind of the cybersecurity reasons to it, one good way to kind of think about this is with like the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So if you guys aren't familiar with that, the MITRE ATT&CK framework is kind of a generalization of how bad actors and threat actors can kind of walk through and take advantage of a system through an attack. So if we kind of look at that and start thinking about it, the first one, right, if we have some decent segmentation, you can generally get them when they're trying to get in your network, we can try to stop, you know, or, or make it difficult there. Assuming that there is a breach though, this will start to move laterally and discover the environment. So we can, instead of making it look like this wide open ocean of goodness that they can go after, you can try to uh, shrink the view. And then if we shrink the view, we can stop them from moving through the network too. All right, so again, again generally pretty common sense ideas, but trying to level set that there's really good reasons we need to be doing all this. Uh, diving in further, right, if we get into it, attacker breaches the perimeter. If there is no segmentation, they're free to move laterally. You have a really big problem. If they are, uh, if we have good segmentation, they breach the perimeter, and they maybe get a host, you know, an application. We really limited the damage and tried to, to control it. So with that, right, everyone kind of, you know, knew, you know, if we, uh, that we needed a network segmentation. If we go back to the, you know, early days, and, and frankly, lots of people are still kind of stuck here. Um, we had everything, all our eggs in one basket. You, Apple users came into buildings, giant campuses, giant uh, branch offices, and all of our applications lived in an internal data center. So it was easy, right? We grabbed everything that we had, put a wall around it, a moat around it, and protected it. So it kind of resulted in the you know fun pop tart idea, right? There was pop tarts all around it from everyone missed breakfast. But the idea behind it being it's hard exterior. We're going to protect the, the front door, and then everything inside is open. You know, um, you know, think about even like our first firewalls probably everyone deploy, right? What were your general things you set up inside and outside? We explicitly distrust outside and we explicitly trust inside. It wasn't necessarily a bad thing. That was just the way the world was at, but we need to start to move out of those worlds, right? And to kind of think of it, it you know, even when you guys all showed up here in the office, right? We have a badge reader on the front door. You guys are all in here now. What's stopping everyone from office surfing on their way out, look, opening drawers and looking for goodies? Absolutely nothing, right? Because our security is at the front door, not necessarily, you know, things moving east and west within it. Uh, how did that start to look as we, you know, actually put networks to it? We had principles where all the control, again, was at the, the edge. So we get a firewall at the edge that could be doing, you know, all the control points. So like web application firewalling, layer seven firewalling, IPS, IDS, um, web filtering, all that stuff lived at the edge of the network. And we had implicit trust inside. 
you know, because of the constructs we talked about earlier, or maybe like audit requirements or QoS reasons, like good network behavior, you know, people kind of were forward thinking and started breaking different use cases into different VLANs or network segments. So, you know, you may have an enterprise segment, a voice segment, a guest segment, things like that. But in those early days, right, there's nothing stopping different segments. So we had a decent, you know, intention, but that intention was never controlled, right? There was nothing stopping all these eight enterprise people from getting permit to HVAC systems that are spread out throughout the environment, right? It's all just big, wide open routed networks. The other things that come out in this world is you don't really have a lot of knowledge about traffic flows, right? Because there's no, there's no visibility point or anything like that. Maybe you're getting a span or a tap off of a, a switch but the overall visibility is lacking. So everyone realized we have a problem though, right? So what's the next step that people started to move to? We started taking those same constructs we already had and dropping ACLs everywhere, right? So this whole ACL, you know, ACL everywhere type approach, we put routed ACLs on here so that way enterprise can't get to HVAC because we knew that's a massive problem. They didn't update their Windows 2012 server. Um, where we start to run into challenges with this stuff is scale, right? Obviously, uh, I'm sure you guys have experienced that world. Same with like port security stuff. So I had another client, uh, it was actually a county government that did uh, sticky max on every port in the environment to meet, you know, like NAC type requirements. It became someone's full-time job to do nothing but reset tickets on sticky Mac requests of, hey, I moved, please clear the Mac, right? And an end user has no idea what they're going through other than I plugged into a port and it doesn't work. Right, just really crappy poor man's knack. Um, but it did better than nothing, right? I mean, that's, and that's kind of the approach, and I feel like the world that a lot of organizations have been stuck in for a while. So we took these network ideas, we started creating security constructs based around network principles we already had, you know, ports, IPs, VLANs, things like that. So again, kind of some pros and cons of that, right? It is pro, it, you already had some infrastructure in place, so we're utilizing what you have. It's air quote free, you know, free as in, you know, it didn't cost any software, hardware, you know, things of that. Not so free, and it became someone's full time job, you know, resetting sticky max, right? Uh, managing and operating environments like that is very difficult. Um, you know, cons to this whole thing you have no idea or control over what gets put in what segment. Right, if someone can go pick a port on the wall, and if it's hot, that's the segment they got, and they bypass your guys' security mechanism. Um, it's none of that stateful. You start doing like router actables, though that stuff's not stateful. Um, and your static and policy, it's whatever that time was that day that they hit the sticky mac. Right, it's that day and time where you assigned that IP or the, that network. Um, there's no visibility into it. We don't necessarily know if that policy is working. You don't necessarily know if that policy is right, right? How many people have walked into an environment and you look at the firewall policy and go, why is that rule there? I don't know. You know, someone put it in a decade ago and we carried it over with every firewall upgrade. Um, the other thing I've seen that happens in this world to get some over some of these stateful and, and other challenges is firewalls everywhere, right? Again, uh, a lot of my background is in local government. I've had like local city municipalities take micro firewalls and they're putting it every well site. Right, so now you're managing, you know, a set of ACLs everywhere, and maybe 500 firewalls in an environment, right? And that starts to get difficult at scale. So what was kind of the next evolution that has come at this? It said, well, maybe we can do some level of macro, right? It's better than the port security and some of these ACLs that we have all over the place. Um, and we can start to get things in macro segments, right? We already know our voice VLAN. We already know our enterprise network. We already know our HVAC or building controls. So how can we, you know, take these constructs, these network constructs, and try to get a little bit more segmentation with basic network constructs? And so that took people to a world of using overlays. Um, so almost becoming like a carrier in your own enterprise environment. So acting like uh, and putting a, you know, an overlay over the top of like eVPN or MPLS, things like that. So in those environments, you end up getting that same type of idea where we took like our enterprise VLAN and our HVAC VLAN before, but we've now mapped them to a different VRF. So we have route independence of it too, or route table independence. So that like our enterprise network now cannot talk to the HVAC network. They're in entirely different route tables. So there's a pro, right? We've made some level of progress as a result of this. Um, you know, but then you, because you get in the route table independence, <laughs> enterprise can still get to the enterprise side because they're in the same route table freely and openly, right? HVAC can get to HVAC freely and openly because we're in a, in, you know, route table segmentation. Um, 
What then ends up happening, because there you know, are use case examples where maybe someone in enterprise needs to get to an HVAC system to maintain it, manage it, things like that. We end up uh, creating different VRFs you know, within the, the infrastructure. So like our single router before, right, where I virtualized it, and that's the idea behind the colors here, is that we get different VRF segments up to a core, then put a centralized firewall in place. So now you're starting to get centralized firewalls you know, that are massive because you have to control every east-west flow through it, you know, between those, mac uh, those macro segments, uh, doing different instances or zones, you know, I've seen it done both ways, for those different VRFs and segments, to finally get a default route point that's a converged router, right? So in this example, then, you'd end up with a point where someone in enterprise needs to talk to HVAC, their default route is gonna take them out a core through a firewall, get to a, you know, a, a aggregated route point where all the route tables converge, so they can pass all the way back down again. Right, so you start to get a lot of inefficiencies in routing. You start to get giant choke points in the center where you need massive equipment and things like that, right? So we still have some cons, but we got some pros right out of it too. Because you did have elevate you know, some basic VLAN constructs, map them into individual route tables. In theory now, our HVAC system you know, is entirely isolated from everything else. It's all in its own route table. Um, the con to it, right, we got some giant central boxes in the center of it. It's extraordinarily complicated because unless you have an enterprise background, most people, you know, don't. And running, you know, overlay technologies is not simple. Um, and then you have that hairpin problem. So where can we start to take some of this stuff, right? Where it's kind of this next journey or, or vision to it, right? So we've kind of looked at like, you know, the old Pop-Tart way. And what happens if we start to put some level of an overlay on top of it? You know, kind of this next, how can we utilize the, the world that's changing to do it? And that, that gets down to like kind of this mecca of micro segmentation, right? And I think everyone's talked about it, everyone's heard about it. Like this is not new concepts, um, but we're starting to get to a point with software where it's actually achievable. And so as we look at some of those gaps, right, in the previous things, everything I've talked about before was around like network constructs. So we haven't discussed application at all, which is probably the most critical part of this, right? We need to start thinking about apps where they live. They're not in, you know, big iron data, uh, data centers anymore. They're not in the same building as your users often. Um, we haven't talked about users at all, right? Through all this, it was all still stuck on VLANs and IP addresses and, you know, different maybe type of ideas like enterprise, HVAC, building controls, guests. Um, and really what needs to start to be happening as part of a policy is all the major W questions, right? Who's accessing the resource? I mean, the user matters. A guest user versus an enterprise user is entirely different for the access they should be getting uh, versus a contractor versus, you know, whoever, whoever. You know, in an education environment, access level of a, a teacher versus a student should be entirely different. Right, you start thinking about enterprise or you know customers. What the access level that you know um, uh, you know a simple user versus like an HR user should be different. Things like that. What application are they trying to get to? You know those should be mapped together in some intelligent manner. We should have applications that are accessible by the right user and not open to everyone. Um, where are they at? You know, where are they coming from? If someone's trying to get to your HR system from China, it probably matters on a little bit differently if they're doing it here locally. Um, you know, what type of resource, you know, where they're at, you know, what are they coming from a mobile device? Are they coming from, you know, the type of device? How are they trying to access it? All this matters in context for creating a right policy. And then that policy can generally in the world we're moving to is dynamic because users change all the time. Where they're at changes, the type of device they're, they're coming from changes. And it shouldn't be static and tied to general network constructs like IP, Mac, switchboard, fun things like that. So then to get down to it, what is micro segmentation? So it's a IT best practice where we're looking at, again, like I said, we're trying to tie workload and application to user. We should get down to that level of, of security and policy where user maps to application and process. And there should be a process that controls the two. Uh, we want to isolate those environments so that way, you know, everything is isolated and there's an implicit no trust where you have to have those, those allowed policies. And everything should be protected at ingress and ingress at ingress and egress at every point. Right, we shouldn't be having to rely on a big edge firewall or a centralized point to do this. We should bring policy as close to the user and workload as possible so we can affect like the change at the point. 
Um, and all this stuff should be detecting and, and giving visibility into it. You guys need to know when something happened. It can't just be waiting for a phone call from a help desk. It can't be waiting until every printer in the office starts printing a ransom note, right? It's too late at that point. Right? We need visibility that the policy is working and that it can dynamically change and adapt to it. So when we get into that concept, right, you get the idea of like segmentation versus micro segmentation, right? We go back to that same type of idea. We get, you know, hacker man, Mr. Bad Dude on the internet, if he's trying to get in the front door and he can get to a host in a normal segmented environment, he's going to spray everywhere, right? Control didn't work because it's you know at the edge. Once it, it if you got bypasses the one control, it's game on everywhere. In a micro segmented environment, we can start to actually apply policy at every different host, at right? every different user, and, and try to limit that sprawl. You know, if we think about this, you know, a different way, right, or another way, it would be kind of like a submarine, right? So uh, if, you, if you think of trying to create failure domains, so if you have without micro segmentation, you get a whole poke, uh, poke in the, the, the hall, the entire thing's going down, you get micro segmented, you poke a hole in the hall, you maybe lose, you know, one, one area of the sub, right? Um, so visualization for that, but just that the general idea behind it, right? We're trying to create failure domains and silos. <laughs> To limit damage. So what does that start to look like in a modern world, right? So we've kind of flown through some of the, the you know, legacy ways, right? And, and it starts to getting to software defined. So we can start to solve these use cases with software because it scales a lot larger and a lot broader. Um, and there's a couple different ways to do it. And frankly, every part of the environment can utilize different solutions. There's really no silver bullet to, to this one at all. Um, so if we kind of think about traditional networking, so in traditional networking, uh, you know, the environment where you guys are probably managing now, the control plane and data plane resides on the same box. And so you log into a switch or router, right? You're managing it locally on that switch or router, and then it's also passing packets on that switch and router. So every device is equally as smart and can make decisions. It's the whole thing is, is you know, all in one, right? We have not abstracted that management plane out yet. When we start to get into software to find that control plane, that management plane, and that comes out and becomes centralized. So this concept, for whatever reason, often scares traditional network admins. And, you know, frankly, it's something we do all the time or have done for a long time. We've just done it in one part of the environment and it needs to start to spread everywhere else. If you think about it, this is how wireless has been managed forever. Right. I mean, when you get no one logs into an individual AP to configure an SSID, no one in God logs into an individual AP to configure radio settings. Right? All that stuff happens at a controller. Right. And the idea behind it is you want a consistent experience throughout your wireless environment. You want to authenticate people the same way. You want them to roam. You want them to get all that consistent environment and the mistake of, you know, you get environments with thousands of APs. And it's impossible to log into a thousand APs and configure all of them individually, right? So we need that unique experience and wireless to start to, to, you know, filter down to the rest of the environment. And so if we think about like, you know, again, there's lots of solutions out there, lots of vendors, and we're going to kind of speak on some of this stuff. And it's it's different every in every environment. But as we start to think about it, like there should be some core features when you're starting to look at these solutions. So automation becomes key, right? Again, think about our wireless controller example. You know, one logs into a thousand APs. They log into one controller, create a new SSID, boom, it's over a thousand APs, right? That's automation, right? Even in a crude scale, it's not exactly how a controller works, but that same type of idea, right? You want it to hit everywhere. Um, and we should get some ability to do micro segmentation, right? The whole reason we're here for this, this, this conversation, um, you know, software defined should have the ability to do that at a minimum. Those two should be, you know, things that we're looking at. Uh, in addition, right, centralized management and monitoring also becomes extraordinarily critical. We want to know what policies need to be affected, what traffic's happening, things like that, so we can control it. So what does that start to look like as we move into different parts of the, of the environment? So the big one that I think everyone's heard of, wrestles with, right, is, is in the campus. Um, the absolute major player in the campus for this one is Cisco with SDA. Um, Cisco SDA kind of takes the, the same concepts we walked through earlier with like the ACL everywhere and the macro, 
uh, segmentation with an overlay and it blends them together in a pretty elegant solution when it's all said and done. So you end up taking a controller, Cisco DNA Center, um, you know, Cisco Catalyst Center, they've changed the name a couple times on us now, uh, to, to automate and management uh, off of all this. But the end idea is our VRS before from like a software overlay, like an MPLS, EVPN, things like that, become VNs. So you get these big buckets, big macro segments again. Think again like our enterprise, our users, and our things, our HVAC controller. They're creating VRFs, they're calling them VNs, right? same type of idea, some big construct macro overlay where they're independent route tables. And then instead of putting access lists or ACLs on every single switch port, on every single routed interface and all that type of idea, we take that ACL everywhere and they do it with taggings with security group, you know, SG, uh, the security group ACLs. So you end up getting then constructs within it. So even though we have our big enterprise route table, right, our enterprise virtual network, you're able to write different independent ACLs between employees and contractors, you know, in this example. So we kind of get a blending of both worlds that are happening at a one single control point. All right, so you're now able to manage all that out of DNA Center um, and involve the entire network all in kind of one, one fall swoop. So as we get into my clicker, whatever reason, every button but right is working. Um, as we look at that, so kind of what it starts to, to, you know, overlay, like I said, right, you get this big fabric, right, so again, managed no different than like an access point with a controller that, that people are very comfortable with now. We have uh, DNA Center as a controller that's managing all the switch environment underneath it. You're driving some level of identity and policy at a Cisco ICE, right, we still need to create, you know, business policy. We still need to know that a contractor has different access than a main employee that's different than a guest, you know, uh, things like that. So how do we identify everything on here to dynamically put that policy? Cisco ICE, you know, helps with that piece. And then, you, and then you start to create, you know, with those SGTs policy mapping. So we let contractor talk to the internet. We don't let contractor talk to, talk to HVAC, right? And you start to build constructs in a very logical manner for that, that makes sense to business people, makes sense to, you know, normal humans and we're not dealing with 10 dot, you know, eight can talk to 10 dot nine, right? No one knows what 10 dot eight and 10 dot nine are, right? That just folks on this call in this room do not business people, not actual things that would drive policy. Uh, the other part to this, right? I think everyone freaks out about it. No one knows kind of like a unicorn, right? No one seen SDA running in the wild. It absolutely is out there, right? We have uh, successful deployments in production. You know, happy to talk through all that. It's not this, you know, scary unicorn that, you know, everyone's still trying to chase and capture and see one in the wild. Um, definitely something that is, is out there and should be a strong consideration for how to count, uh, accomplish some of these, these challenges. <clears throat> the other way, right, or the next way we kind of want to highlight or talk about is SASE. So secure access security edge. So if we think about in the, the old drawings before, right, all of our security controls are on the perimeter. You know, the world has changed though and evolved. Applications aren't in our data centers anymore. They're in multiple data centers we may be control. They're also in the cloud. They're also in SaaS, right? They're, they're everywhere. Same with our users, right? I mean, all of A&M doesn't work in this office. We're spread out everywhere, right? And I'm sure you guys are the same way, right? You get distributed over lots of branch locations. You may have some huge campuses. We're now getting lots of work from home and hybrid work uh, scenarios. And the end result is our big brick iron edge fortified uh, security model is struggling or doesn't frankly work or scale. So in you know, SASE or Secure Access Service Edge, they've taken all of those types of features and moved them to the cloud, right? And, no, and then create a distributed model of it. So it doesn't matter where your user is, no different than like if you guys go to Google right now, you're hitting a Google that's somewhere, data center somewhere in the Southwest. They're not taking you to a Google data center in Ireland, right? It doesn't make sense. It's the same with this type of model. You start to get distributed security points everywhere through the internet. You know, highly robust, highly fast like that. Um, they've now taken all the different components of that security edge and put it into one kind of bundling, right? So if we get into that, at a minimum, you need uh, these types of offerings you have a secure web gateway, so you can be doing, you know, URL filtering and stuff at scale at the edge. You start to think about too, like um, uh, 
decrypt and you know to actually inspect that stuff right it starts to get very difficult on prem this whole decrypt ssl cert game gets extraordinarily challenging on prem and at cloud computing scale it gets much easier um, you start to get you know remote access solutions so like your work from home people will get get a secure connectivity through this this brokering too you get firewall as a service up in the cloud you can do some level of rise of browser ice isolation you know, kind of a CASB or cloud access security broker. So start to decide, you know, maybe we are a box shop and we don't want people going to Dropbox, right? Because that could be file and data loss, right? So you're starting a, a broker on what cloud, cloud uh, services are available um, and things like that, right? And, you know, so how does that start to look actually deployed, right? Um, it kind of paints the picture of where we're at, right? We've got users everywhere. You know, they could be remote, they could be home, Starbucks, you guys here in our office, connected back to your resources to keep an eye on your job. We get branch and campus users, and our applications now are everywhere, right? So they could be on an on-prem data center, it can be infrastructure as a service, it can be SaaS apps, right? What users need to access is spread, and where users are at has spread. So when you get this now cloud solution in the middle with all the security controls and everyone gets essentially brokered or tunneled there in an intelligent manner. So we get a remote user, they have a, cl a client that's always on on their machine. That machine is gonna take all traffic and force it up to the, the cloud edge. We're able to put policy. And we're now putting that policy based on what that user should be able to access, what cloud resources and applications should they be able to get to. Uh, if that user moves on-prem, it can be you know, set up such that like, you can even get to the point where your on-prem branches are no different than like a Starbucks, kind of this idea of a cafe model. We're just providing an internet link, right? And it doesn't matter. So when this guy comes into the office, his client stays on and he's good, right? His policy moves with him. The other way it can be deployed is you can actually create the tunnel straight from the branch. So you can start to create that policy of anything that's in that network now is controlled and, and uh, set up. And we can start to identify different segments off of the route point here to provide different application access, you know, going northbound. Um, and that stuff then gets brokered, you know, via security edge into your guys' internal data center or up to SAS. So you kind of get this, you know, security in the cloud, right, that gets stuck up. So we're taking, you know, some of our edge controls and moving them into the cloud so they can be mobile and move with users, move with the applications, uh, things like that. The other part that becomes really critical in this is the WAN, right? So if we went back to where the branches were before, you know, it starts to, to get to the point where, you know, old school circuits from carriers, MPLS circuits, things like that, that intermix all, intermix all your campus branches and data centers together, start to make less sense, right? And the reason they make less sense is our applications aren't necessarily in our data centers anymore. And we can start to do things like SD-WAN on top uh, to control these flows. So SD-WAN gives the ability and, and is important to the segmentation point because you can service chain and stitch these, these tunnels. So we can make route decisions uh, at a branch site of how they're going to go to a data center. We can make uh, route decisions at a branch site of how they're allowed to go to uh, you know, a SASE provider to, to get you know, security policy enabled. We can make decisions there how they're going to get to the Internet Direct right for SaaS services, things like that. You move away from being carrier uh, reliant, right? And because now we're just open to internet circuits, you can start to size circuits a little bit more intelligently. You can get redundant circuits. You can start adding uh, LTE or 5G on top of it as a backup, and it's not going to change the end security policy and metric, right? And we can manage and secure all of that from a controller everywhere. Again, get back to the software defined idea. You're configuring it once and affecting policy uh, potentially across all your branch and WAN sites. So there's, you know, a lot of benefits to, to the SASE or SSE technology idea, right? It handles, you know, a lot of different use cases in a very consistent manner with a lot of feature set, right? As you start to think about, you know, again, where all users can be, where all our applications can be, how do we get that stuff to follow and be, be consistent throughout, provide one, a consistent end user experience and a same secure experience, um, it's, it's able to move with them. Um, the other 
you know, big advantage to it is with it being cloud native, it's extraordinarily uh, elastic, right? We can scale up and down as our user base and our needs scale. The consumption model is generally user specific, right? So you pay for the size you are. It's not like you have to go buy these huge firewalls. It's not like we have to buy, you know, big components uh, the future grow, like, oh, I wonder how big my internet connection is going to be in five years. I need to buy a firewall for that size instead of what I am at now, All right? You grow as your size. Um, it's geographically dispersed. So, you know, I, we have lots of different organizations in here, and that matters more to, to others, right, depending on your type of organization you guys are. But instead of having a centralized data center in Phoenix and my users are in New York, Right. And now we have latency, connect, you know, potential challenges or having, you know, think, or if they're abroad, things like that, it follows it. Right. So these are in the same type of data center, same type of colos that your major SaaS providers are anyway. So oftentimes you're connecting to them and then we just have cross connects in the back end to get you to the cloud services anyway. Um, and you get a lot of interoperability, like these are newer solutions that are open to APIs, things like that. You can get a lot of third party that's put in top of it. So now kind of where I think a lot of this has evolved, and frankly, it's probably some of the more mature is in the data center side of the house. So in the data center side of the house, there's been solutions for micro segmentation for, you know, a little bit longer and probably a little bit more mature. Um, we start to think about micro segmenting a data center. There's kind of four major pillars that need to be thought of and looked at. And they kind of all feed each other. In a perfect world, we get a closed loop. And so the first part of that is visibility, right? There needs to be the ability in, uh, to know, you know, what are you protecting, right? Um, like if we had a quick show of hands, who even has a remote guess of how many applications our enterprise is running? Right? The answer, like that, not shocking, right, and is, is most people don't know, right? Or your guess is going to be wildly off. If we then asked you, all right, your major application, like the one that defines your organization, what's all it made up of and what's it talk to? All right, maybe we got a web host, maybe a database host, but is it talking to some centralized service for like Active Directory, DHCP? Is it doing a DNS call? All right, like you start to actually think about all the stuff that's involved in an application and how it works, and it gets way more complicated than people think, which is why, you know, Historically, it's, this hasn't been tackled. Um, now, right, we have a lot of tools in the tool belt. So step one is we need to understand what all this looks like, which generally involves application dependency mapping, getting some historical and real-time data, right, of, of what those flows look like, what is that application doing, how has it historically behaved, um, things like that, trying to get context in all of it. Once we know what we have, we can now write a policy. Right? So you'll generally take application dependency mapping and try to figure out, you know, what this policy should be, and the two should marry, right? Like we should take what we know and write an intelligent policy around it. Um, it should be very tightly coupled, you know, to the visibility portion as a result of it, and these things are dynamic, right? That's the other thing to call out. What happens if all of a sudden you, it's busy season, you burst and you scale, right? We add more, work, more web hosts to the whole Apple app, right? That policy is dynamically moved. And then we enforce it. So we take our policy that we have and enforce it. There's various different ways to do this that we'll kind of get into, right? Oftentimes it's forced directly at the workload, right? That whole idea of micro segment in the beginning that should be happening at every workload, ingress and egress. And then we report on it. So we get a closed loop. Did our policy work? Did the application change? Things like that. It also speeds up, you know, time to audit greatly because we can run a report that says, yep, yeah, Here's my PCI host. They've only talked to PCI. You know, go have fun, auditors. All right? We have a policy. We've monitored it. We understand our applications. We've enforced it. And here's a report that says we've enforced it. So as we kind of dive into some of those different buckets, right? The first one being that vi that visibility piece. What does that look like, and how does that happen? So there's a couple different ways to get the data, but in, eventually the first step is you get this discovery phase. So you're going to load agents, right, which there's pros and cons of all these. Um, the agents are really powerful, though, frankly, right? You get an agent on your application or on your, on your host, um, and it starts to create these dependency maps. Like these are real screenshots out of 
four different tools, frankly, because there are lots of different options in this, where you start to see what the workloads are doing. You start to see what ports they're communicating on. If you get it at an agent level, you can even start to map services, right? Like this application is running this service. The service is open on this port and this port is, you know, being communicated with, with this other host on the other end that's running this service, right? So you can start to see all that stuff over time and get a ton of data. With that, we start to create flow maps, right? So we can see that this host talk to this host and, you know, over time, you can map it. And then we add third-party context too. So you can map the, uh, this stuff with like CMDBs and different orchestration systems and different management systems to get a picture of what your data center is doing, right? And that idea is being that it needs to be revolve around the application, right? All these applications are different. It's way more complicated than your typical three-tier stuff, right? And just by nature, right? That's, I think we, we probably oversimplified this stuff over time. So once we know what we have, we can build a policy. And so those policies then, right, we can start to map all the, visit, the, the lines before, right, constructs and policies around it. That stuff's typically done with grouping or tags, so that way you can scale, right? So we know, like, and, and these things can be done all different ways. We can get application specific, right, of this is my primary ERP app. My primary ERP app has these flows and these rules, and I'm going to allow it, right? We've also, you can tag things like dev and test. Dev and test gets a different tag. It gets a different policy rule, um, stuff like that. You... It's integrated with that visibility piece, like we had talked about, because you want your policy to match what your application dependency mapping is and things like that. Um, and then because that policy is generally built on grouping or tags, it can move anywhere. So if your application moves to a DR site because you have an event, you guys spin up another data center and another geo, it moves with it. You move it, that application to the cloud, it moves with it, right? Because this idea is it's, it's tied to a group or a tag that's built off of the, what we saw in the visibility piece. So then how do we enforce it? So enforcement then starts to actually, actually happen at the workload. Like we had talked about, we want this to be ingress and egress at every workload point, right? To, to keep it secure. Um, you're gonna pack, basically pass through a firewall at every point in the connection over and over and over again, right? Which it creates a lot of security and a lot of visibility in the environment. So if we take, you know, again, a, a really very, very simple crude example because we're sticking on a PowerPoint, but we got our favorite application. Favorite application, you know, is reliant on a database and a web server, you know, typical three-tier app. All right. We also have, it's not the only thing we have in our data center. We got a DMZ host sitting out here too. So we had, based on our application dependency mapping, we figured out that, you know, app, our favorite app has a web server, a database server, we're going to allow it. It's green. We're not going to allow any of those DMZ hosts to talk about talk to it, you know, because that was not part of our dependency mapping. It was not part of the, the visibility and the policy we've created. So if someone gets and owns a DMZ host, they can't move laterally now, right? We have not allowed that. It's not explicitly part of the policy. You know, it's it's they were stuck, right? If, worst case scenario, he got one host. That probably didn't matter that whole whole much because it was sitting in your DMZ anyway. All right, so. Um, we're, we're in the old world, right? There is a decent chance all these are on the same VLAN. Because, you know, we evolved from VMware, right? Everyone went, oh, I got a data center network. Oh, VMware came along. Now I can start spinning up a ton of hosts. Poof, right? We've had sprawl, right? And they're, they're all in the same segment or maybe multiple segments that are just switched between at the edge. And for, you know, kind of how does that feed into the, the reporting piece at the end, right? We can go back now and show in a compliance report that our favorite really simple app was protected, right? That is the policy that our favorite our PCI app had, and that's all that it's allowed to talk to. Uh, we're able to, you know, catch misconfigured rules because we have visibility into what's getting flagged all the time. Like this is not working, not working, not working. Oh, maybe we need to allow that connection. We can start to see connections that are happening you know, we're spreading that that shouldn't have happened um, and then closed loop feed it, right? Whatever comes out of the report, we can feed back into visibility, create more policy, start enforcing it, right? Because this is, these environments are dynamic. They're always changing, right? You're just spinning up apps all the time. Uh, how does this stuff start to get enforced? 
well, there's lots of vendors in this marketplace and they can enforce it, frankly, at three major points. And everyone does it a little bit differently. Um, we, you can get it at the network layer, right? So think of like, um, you know, an ACI type solution. You can get it at the hypervisor lot layer, like an NSX type solution or an agent layer. And there's, you know, Gardacore, Lumio, uh, folks like that. Um, and they all kind of play a little bit differently in how they do it. So we go back from, you know, visibility, policy, enforcement, monitoring, the ones that are generally agent-based, right, we can get everything. Right? So the idea behind that is, you know, you've installed an agent on your workload. We now know, like, you know, we talked about that agent's feeding the application dependency mapping, what it's talking to. It knows what services are running on the workload, um, things like that. We can then drive policy off it, enforce it right there on the, we, you know, with the agent and then monitor it after the fact. Um, your hypervisor stuff, you know, does a decent job of that as well. And then when you get traditional network pieces, they generally just happen at the enforcement layer. And, and kind of the reason behind that, right, if you think about it, like, you know, Cisco ACI is a phenomenal product, but you don't get the, the visibility piece feeding inside of it, right? Like to get this visibility piece, you need to be closer to the workload. You know, down lower, not as high up in the, in the networking stack. So if we look at the hypervisor type example. So in the hypervisor type example, uh, like NSX, NSXT, what's ended up happening is at the hypervisor, so like at the VNIC level, we've now put a firewall on every VM that is policies derived, you know, from NSX manager. So you get that SDN component. You have one point you're logging into. We're not logging into a firewall on every VM. We're logging into a centralized controller, right, to get kind of that software defined aspect of it. We're building a policy based on tags and putting those, applying those tags at different VMs. Right? So those different VMs, you know, then take their policy with them um, as they go. And it's physically tied to the VM NIC, not to like the network NIC. So again, that VM, it doesn't matter where it moves. It can be in your primary data center, it can move to a failover data center, it can move burst to the cloud. It's policies tied to its VNIC and it's moving with it. So again, we're not writing IP-based rules and things like that, that, oh no, we had a DR event. How do I rechange my firewall rules for every new you know, network segment that's moved? The agent-based uh, one, and again, there's many players in this, um, but picking Lumio as an example, they all, all work the same way. Um, these are very cool because when you put that agent on the actual workload or on the host itself, you start to get, you know, a ton of data. So we get integrated application dependency mapping. You're getting integrated telemetry data because you know everything that's happening on it anyway. Uh, and then it's really easy to enforce policy because you're making it all within that centralized controller, that centralized point, and it's forcing the policy on the Windows uh, firewall or Linux like IP tables. So when it's dynamically adjusting that host constantly to map the policy that you're created that's based on the feasibility of what it's seeing because it's right there on, on the, the uh, VM itself, it's right there on the, the workload. Um, these are very effective and, and frankly, you know, places that uh, are, are really good starting points for organizations, even just to get the application dependency mapping part, right? Uh, which is absolutely critical on step one. All right, so some strategies for kind of a successful project, right? Because I'm sure, you know, if we again did a show of hands not to make people do it. There's all, everyone's had a project or, or an idea around this. These are not new concepts. These are not concepts that have been around, you know, they've been around a while. They're just hard to accomplish. Um, what's that journey generally look like? It, it kind of like we talked about from the Pop-Tart to ACL, you know, to Macro, the software defined, the entire intention is to reduce this attack surface area. So you want to go from, you got in my front door and have fun, right? You guys came in from our front door because with because it's open and we can go in everyone's office now, right? Wide open to starting to reduce the surface area. So that way, what you're, it's, it, assume breach, right? So if we're assuming breach, we want to assume, give them the smallest area to operate with it. Um, so that moves us from perimeter decisions and down from, edge to our ACLs anywhere to like, we want to get down to the user. We want to get down to the individual workload, um, stuff like that. So that should be the objective and the general goal, right? As we're starting to think about these pieces, 
how can we reduce the attack surface area? Every project should be thought about, about like that. So then how do these projects fail, right? And again, I would not be surprised if most people in the room have done this at least once, probably more like two or three times, right? Everyone gets excited, we need a segment. There's been some initiative, there's been some no compliance or audit reason, we need drive drives the decision. Everyone gets super excited, we're gonna go, we're gonna go talk to every Cisco, we're gonna go talk to VMware, we're gonna go talk to Gardecore, we're gonna go talk to anyone and everyone, we're gonna pick a solution. Well, there is no, that getting into a silver bullet mindset, there generally is not a silver bullet. You're going to end up with solutions for your campus and your branch and your WAN that's different than the solution for your data center, you know, uh, that's different from like a cloud or remote access solution. So we get all fired up to find the one that can make it work for everybody. It can't, right? We're going to segment everything. We can't. It gets really, you know, hard. Everyone fights over what the tool is going to be. Everyone fights about how we're going to do it. Everyone freaks out, project gets stuck. Now the CISOs moved on, the key champions moved on, and we start this whole thing all over again. And maybe we got one thing carved out, right? Or maybe we did one, you know, you know, things like that. Um, it, and we repeat the process five years later and so on and so forth, and why we're all still in this room together. So how clients we've seen be successful at this? I mean, some general advice, right? Start with risk-based approach. So figure out where where is what keeps people up at night the most, right? Is it the most critical app in your environment, and that's the one we need to start with? Is it the fact that we're running Windows 2012 servers at every closet for you know video recording, right? Is it uh, you know an audit risk, like oh you know I, we just failed the last three audits, we can't fail a fourth, right? We need to get this under control. Um, Try to figure out which systems and data, if they were compromised, would harm the organization the most. Right? Start to frame it in those types of decisions. Um, that's generally you know, where we've seen the most success. Let's try to go after a very targeted, important use case. And, let, and then the other big piece is investing in visibility tools. You know, getting those application dependency mapping, trying to figure out what's you know, even base inventory of what's in your guys' environment. Um, those are really critical to get this stuff started correctly and right. Right, some use cases that we have seen, you know, some of those that have worked, right, is production from dev and test, right, that stuff's pretty straightforward and a little bit more easy, uh, uh, successful. Just getting a win or two in this world is pretty important. Uh, like we talked about kind of picking your Saki, you know, application, right, go after an audit risk, um, stuff like that. We want to get, you know, things that are, are the most bang for the buck for the organization on day one. And then lastly, right, you know, I did, you know, this was a lot of information. We didn't go crazy deep into some of the different parts, but, you know, A&M would love to help, right? Every organization is very different in these, right? So what's important to your organization from how your users are at, where, where they're at, um, you know, what type of devices, what type of applications, and marrying all this is very unique, right? Every organization is unique, uh, and we'd love to be, you know, a partner in that journey, you know, so we can do POCs and all these different technologies. We have a very good lab that Matt runs that we can uh, demo and showcase a lot of this stuff. We've got um, application dependency mapping tools that we, we can help to, to kind of get an idea on it and even do basic segmentation, you know, assessments and workshops and things like that. Um, so we'd love to help, you know, everybody, you know, given the opportunity and, you know, kind of appreciate your guys' time and, you know, uh, thank you guys for joining us. So happy to dive into questions, right? We had kind of set this up and it went a little quicker than I was thinking. I was shooting for around an hour of me spieling to you guys. Uh, we got a handful of engineers in the room, you know, we'd love to, to get into specifics. So if anyone has any questions, and then I think Amanda had the, a feast coming for the lunch portion of it. Um, so we can, you know, kind of eat and, and mingle and kind of whiteboard if uh, that works for you guys. I uh, appreciate everyone's time. So I, you know, we have the room. I think there's folks online too. I don't know if 
uh, how you guys wanted to handle that, uh, JR and Amanda. Like, if anyone's got any questions, you know, happy to take them. Uh, if you guys I'm, on the uh, webinar want to. Yeah, ahead, just JR. monitoring the chat. Um, I didn't see any questions in the chat yet, but I'll let you know if anybody does have anything. All right. I have a question. Yeah. So what I'm getting out of this, and I, I don't know if I'm right, is that once this is deployed, it sounds like there are agents on all of the devices, including the workstations, all of the network devices. Is that true? It depends. Is that the right understanding? It, it absolutely depends, and it certainly can, yeah. So it depends okay. on what kind of model you guys are after and what makes sense for the environment. Um, but oftentimes that is one of the solutions that, that happens, especially in the data center. And you know, if you guys are in a hybrid work environment, or even a full remote or hybrid, it could definitely make sense to go with an agent-based solution and like a SASE solution for the users too. Um, and then you can start to get the advantage to that is now you have visibility of what users need too, and we, can, and we know who's on the machine. All right, so you know that it's you who's on the machine and you need access to this application and that stuff's very easy to broker now. So, absolutely. Yeah, the, the thing with the agents is that it's kind of nice because you don't need to change anything in your network to deploy the technology. You don't need to change IPs. You don't need to build a VRF. You know, you don't need to migrate. You don't, you're not dependent on any particular type of switch. The, the downside though, is that what about IOT and OT devices, right? If you care about, if you're in manufacturing, a lot of uh, healthcare, right? They got a lot of like things. That's where we get into more of the network based solutions. We're, we're starting to enforce the policy on the switches. Right, and then we're very dependent on what switch model, and you know that takes you down at a kind of a different path. And it's and it's also something we see is do to do some sort of hybrid approach, right? If it if it makes sense. Yeah, but for workstations that human beings log into, it's really elegant. It's the everything else is the challenge, which I'm sure you guys feel. All right, I'm going to chime in since Jared said I was being quiet. And I, I think we had a whole, you know, 45 minutes without you talking. Um, so the other thing I would say there too, that in security, the, the biggest thing we're trying to do is put the control and the protection as close to the threat or the vector as possible, right? And it's one of those things that, that we've been in this battle, agents create performance issues. That's why we see some of this affecting the actual IP tables versus rather than running a whole separate process on it. But that's the other goal here is you're trying to put the control as close to the threat vector as possible. And that's why we see agents and EDR such a huge you know, piece of protecting the security. So that was the only other piece I wanted to throw in, and mainly because Jared said I was quiet the whole meeting. Probably right. And in the chat, we had uh, application dependency mapping tools. So someone asked, you know, what type of tools we have out there for that. Um, you know, there's a good handful, right? I mean, so off the top of my head, right, NSXT, I mean, everything we had on the slide kind of, so NSXT can do it, Cisco Secure Workload uh, does it, so that, or Tetrations, what they called it before they changed their name, Illumio, Gardacore, those would be the top four off the top of my head. Do you have another one, Matt? Yeah, you, know, you also look at potentially coupling traditional visibility tools like ExtraHop, for example, Dark Trace, with uh, an enforcement solution, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be like an all-in-one thing. We feel like that like Illumio, Guard Core, Secure, uh, Secure Workload are really powerful because they kind of like give you the visibility and the enforcement all in one package, right? Whereas if we need to do it with more of like an ACI or, or like a network-based approach, we kind of need that visibility maybe from an extra hop or, or some sort of NetFlow system. Um, and then we could kind of marry them together, right? But it's kind of two solutions that you're kind of putting together. Uh, any others? Bring a toaster for the pop tarts. I do not have a toaster. We have a toaster in the kitchen. And then food will be here in about 10 minutes or so if you guys want to hang out.
Um, but we can thank everyone online and we can close that. Sounds good. Yeah, I appreciate you guys online. If you got no more questions, uh, we'll wrap it up.